Chad Guy Daybell, a grave digger and religious author, married Tammy Daybell in 1990. The couple had five children and were living in Rexburg, Idaho in 2018 when Chad went to a doomsday prepper conference in St. George, Utah to sell his books and speak about his visions and beliefs. That's where he met Lori Vallow and the doomsday couple's affair began. Over the course of the next two years, chaos followed them. Lori's husband, Charles, was shot and killed by her brother, Alex. Chad's wife, Tammy, was found dead under suspicious circumstances. Lori's young children, Tylee and JJ, were reported missing, and a national search for them began. Lori's brother, Alex, was found dead on the toilet. And in the middle of all of this, Chad and Lori made their way to Hawaii for their wedding. And in June of 2020, the search for JJ and Tylee was over when their remains were discovered on the property of former grave digger Chad Daybell. Lori Vallow Daybell has already been convicted for her role in the deaths of her children and Chad's wife, Tammy. Now a second trial has come to an end. The verdict is in for doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Julia Janae filling in tonight for Vinnie Politan, who is on assignment on his new season of Accomplice to Murder. Now today in Boise, Idaho, after nearly six hours of deliberation in the murder trial of the so-called doomsday prophet Chad Daybell, this jury handed down their verdict. Chad Daybell stood silent and emotionless as the clerk read aloud what the jury decided. Here's a look inside that courtroom. In the District Court of the 7th Judicial District of the State of Idaho and in for the County of Fremont. State of Idaho Plaintiff versus Chad Guy Daybell Defendant, case number CR22211623. Verdict. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn to try the above entitled action for our verdict, unanimously answer the questions submitted to us as follows. Question number one. In regards to count one of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tylee Ryan and grand theft by deception? Guilty. Question number two. In regards to count two of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tylee Ryan? Guilty. Question number three. In regards to count three of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow and grand theft by deception? Guilty. Question number four. In regards to count four of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Joshua Jackson Vallow? Guilty. Question number five. In regards to count five of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Guilty. Question number six. In regards to count six of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of first degree murder of Tamara Tammy Daybell? Guilty. Question number seven. In regards to count seven of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of insurance fraud? Guilty. Question number eight. In regards to count eight of the amended indictment, excuse me, in regards to count nine of the amended indictment, is Chad Guy Daybell not guilty or guilty of insurance fraud? Guilty. Guilty on all counts for Chad Guy Daybell. But the doomsday killer couples courtroom saga, it's far from over. Tomorrow, the penalty phase is going to start for Chad's case. And that same jury that determined his guilt for the murders of J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell, they are going to be tasked with deciding whether they should recommend the death penalty as punishment for his crimes or life in prison. And later this hour, we're going to discuss the possible aggravating and mitigating factors that may be presented in that next phase of his trial. We're also looking ahead to August. Chad's wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, she's going to be in a new courtroom in a new state in Arizona, standing trial for her role in the conspiracy 
to murder her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, and Charles charges rather related to the attempted shooting of her niece's ex-husband, Brandon Boudreaux. So much ahead in this case, but today, we can expect there was a lot of reaction to this afternoon's verdict. So let's get all the details from Court TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft outside of the courthouse there in Boise, Idaho. Kelly, I know your eyes and ears were open. Things were energetic there at the courthouse as we were waiting for this verdict to come down. What was the reaction inside of the courtroom there? Good evening to you, Julia. Well, one woman that has been in the courtroom the whole time described the inside of the courtroom as electric. So she has been one of the people that's been here throughout this case, and it was electric. So right before the verdict was read, we got notice. I had just finished a live shot with Court TV, went back up to the courtroom, and we heard a verdict. As soon as we heard that, a lot of people inside the courtroom outbursts, jubilation, people were hugging, people were consoling one another, people were saying that they were nervous. Larry Woodcock, he stood up and he told everyone in a way to calm people down, whatever the verdict is, it is. And then shortly thereafter, the jurors were brought in and then that guilty verdict was read. And that first one on count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder for Tylee Ryan, guilty and then everyone kind of breathed the sigh of relief at least the people that were around me i noticed one woman she clenched her her husband's knee really tightly as that first verdict was read and then kept grabbing it more tightly as the next several verdicts were read in the case also i did have a chance to briefly talk with chad daybell's brother right after the verdict i asked him what he was thinking at the moment and he told me i i really am just Thinking. He has been here several days throughout this trial. He has told me before that he has tried to reach out to his brother while his brother has been in jail on several occasions, but his brother has not responded to him. But Matt Daybell has been here to support the Woodcocks throughout this case. And so just the reaction overall, again, the people running into the courtroom when we heard that there was going to be a verdict, you saw law enforcement officials just sprinting across the street, making their way inside the courtroom to make certain they got a seat. And then afterwards, a lot of people hugging and just very pleased with the verdict. Wow, Kelly, thank you for that description. Uh, let's talk about after the verdict. When we have high profile cases, there's often a press conference afterward. Did we have that in this case and if so who spoke after the verdict was read they immediately moved into the penalty phase for this case so judge Boyce gave everyone a bit of a break then they moved into the penalty phase so it took some time for some of the people to come out of the courtroom in particular Kay and Larry Woodcock JJ Vallow's biological grandparents and also Kay Woodcock is the sister of Charles Vallow who was killed by Alex Cox Lori Vallow Daybell's brother and so eventually you can see there Larry and Kay made their way out of the courthouse when they came down the steps of the Ada County Courthouse a lot of people began cheering and then they made their way to the microphones that were all set up for them to speak and so why don't we go ahead and listen to what Larry Woodcock had to say my little man Canaan Todd Trahan Joshua, Jackson, Vallow. A seven-year-old autistic child. For what? What did they accomplish? Nothing. What did they do? They destroyed family, families. There's one stage left. And I will say this, whatever verdict, whatever sentence the court and the jurors decide on, I will absolutely live with it. 
so many family members inside the courtroom, and then after the verdict was read and after that penalty phase, the beginning of it was complete. We did catch up with a few of the family members as they were leaving, in particular Tammy Daybell's father. We do have some video of him leaving the courtroom. We did ask him if he did want to go on camera and say anything. He didn't at this time. You could see him raising up his, his fist there, his hand there. There were some people that had gone by the courthouse and were beeping their horns. Um, it's showing support for the verdict that these jurors ended up reaching. Well, Julia? That, that fist punch says it all, Kelly, even if he didn't speak. Tammy Day Bell's father there. Uh, you also understand spoke to some other people outside of the courthouse. What did they share? Yes, so after that verdict was read, we did get some video of some law enforcement officers that were leaving. So inside the courtroom, they took up several rows. As I mentioned, when that verdict was read, we saw some of them sprint up to the courtroom, running across the street here in Boise to get inside the courtroom. And then this is some video of them leaving that courthouse. You can see them saying, great day, the giving the thumbs what up. Do you think about the verdict? Great. You can hear him say, um, one of our producers, Tiffany, was asking them what they think of the verdict, and you hear them say, great, but they have worked extremely hard on this case, as well as everyone, the defense counsel, as well as the prosecutorial team, the victim advocates, everyone puts in such an effort in this case, and we did talk also with Dawson Murray. So Dawson Murray is Emma Murray's brother-in-law. Emma Murray is Chad Daybell's daughter. We caught up with him after the verdict, and here is his reaction. Very relieved. It's a it's mixed emotions because um, you, you're happy to know that he's been charged. There's definitely still going to be a healing process for everybody involved in this, and so I'm just mixed emotions, mixed emotions for sure. Did you ever have a doubt? <sighs> Slight, slight percentage, but majority of myself felt like, yeah, it's it's gonna be there. But you, you know, you never know in these situations. You never know, and so there was always that slight bit of doubt. But I was also at the same time pretty confident in our the jury and that they were gonna make the right decision. And again, because the state is pursuing the death penalty in this case, immediately after that verdict, we did move into the penalty phase. And so just began a little bit today in which the judge read some instructions regarding the penalty phase. So proceedings didn't take place very long today after that verdict was read and we moved into that second phase of the trial. But they are going to be back here tomorrow, the jurors, as we really get into this second phase of the trial. Well, Julia? Kelly Craft, you've been there for the entirety of this guilt phase now there is more ahead but it is winding down there in ada county idaho thank you for that report let's bring in our guests this hour to talk about this day this huge verdict day in the case against chad guy daybell we have lori vallow daybell's uncle co-host of the podcast tylee and jj silver linings he's also co-author of the book Lori's Lies and Family Ties. Rex Connor is here. Also joining us is retired police commander, religious cult expert, host of Profiling Evil, and the author of the book Deceived. Mike King is with us. And finally, host of Mormon Stories podcast, John Dillon is with us. So good to have you all here on this verdict day in the case against Chad Daybell. Rex, let me start with you. I know your podcast has the words silver linings in it. Any silver linings today when you see that this is uh, the end of the convictions for both Law Lori and Chad, as long, at least the first convictions for them? Well, of course, we're happy for that verdict. You could call that a silver lining, but also it's just a relief for all of the people that Kelly named that have been involved, the legal teams and the court, uh, the people in court, the, the law army of law enforcement people. She humbly left out, you people in the media played such an important part in this whole process. So a lot of silver linings um, for everyone that's involved, everyone that's put emotional energy into this all around the world. So uh, it is a very positive day and you could call that a big silver lining. Absolutely. Mike King, I want to lean into your religious cult expertise. 
now that you have seen all of the evidence in the case against Lori, against Chad, do you have any questions that still linger? Or just what's your takeaway on this cult that was being created? Well, thank you, Julie. It's great to be uh, on with everyone tonight. I have a lot of questions. I mean, I'm going to continue to have a major question of why. Why was sex or money or power and control so cockeyed motivating that it would lead someone to, to commit homicide? And, and I don't know if we're going to get into some of the things that make this so aggravating, but for me, the questions will continue to remain. Not only what happened in this particular case, but how do we bring enough transparency in these kinds of closed societies or cults, tiny groups that get together and start to come up with wacky ideas? How do we somehow get enough transparency that people who start to look into them still have a support system that might tell them, hey, if you kind of have a different opinion, we're still here for you, and that they might step away. Or people, when they start getting out on the fringe, and this is a group that was definitely on the fringe, that they have a way of somehow getting some common sense brought, brought into the picture. To me, Kelly, I mean, to, uh, Julia, it's all about transparency. And this Church of the Firstborn, Chad Daybell, this group of like-minded individuals, the last thing they wanted was transparency. And inside of that is where all this contempt and evil breeds. And Mike, we are going to get to those aggravators on the other side of this break, but I do want to get John's reaction to this verdict, to this stage in Chad Daybell's court case. I know we have the other phase, we're going to talk about that, but just your reaction to this conviction, were you concerned at all that there might be a not guilty mixed in there? Yeah, I, I think, you know, anytime you have a jury, there's always a chance uh, that an unfavorable ruling might come back or a verdict, but uh, I was overjoyed as, as much as anyone can be overjoyed at such a dark and a sad and a horrific event, but um, justice can never fully be served here. Any verdict is going to be inadequate. Um, but I'm really grateful that I believe the, the correct decision was made. And I'm, I'm really grateful for, uh, like the other panelists, for the media attention. One maybe slight difference that, that I do have with, with Michael is with the contention that this is purely a fringe group or purely a fringe act. I think that we all know that Chad Daybell and Lori Valla were active, faithful, committed, participating members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And while some of their beliefs were fringe, I would say 90 to 95 percent of their beliefs were rooted in Orthodox Mormon doctrine and theology. And we can talk about that more in depth, but I believe that if we don't get to the root of the problem, which are the core beliefs that they were taught as active, faithful, believing Mormons, then we'll just be playing whack-a-mole with the additional crimes and murders that keep emerging, that emerge from these beliefs about the last days, these beliefs about evil demonic spirits that can, that can possess us, the beliefs that our thoughts and feelings can come from an external source. And John, I don't want to cut you off. We are going to be able to talk more about how this may impact the jury, so we have to squeeze in that break. Our guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to look at some of those possible aggravating factors that could be presented in this penalty phase. First, here's a preview of what's coming up in the next hour. In Ocean City, New Jersey, Christopher Greger is accused of abusing and murdering his six-year-old son, Corey. Now, Greger's fate is in the hands of a jury. Today, during deliberations, the jury requested to see the video of Christopher forcing his son, Corey, to run on the treadmill. And tonight, we're bringing in our experts to see what they make of this footage. He treats him like a rag doll, right? He's picking him up, his legs are swinging. And if you look at the defendant's face in this clip, he's like smiling and smirking. 
Friday night. Closing arguments live from CrimeCon 2024. We're taking the show to Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. It's unbelievable, Vinny. For one of the biggest true crime events in the country. Welcome to CrimeCon. I'll be joined by Court TV's Julie Grant and Matt Johnson, along with other prominent figures in the world of true crime. Only a CrimeCon. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan, live from CrimeCon, Friday night, 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. The state has filed a notice of intent to seek the death penalty, and so a second phase of this trial called the sentencing phase will be taking place next. Now that Chad Daybell has been found guilty on all counts, the jury is going to be shifting their focus to whether or not he should spend his life in prison or be subjected to the death penalty. Now, the court documents filed by the prosecution, it outlines for us what those aggravating factors they're going to be arguing in front of this jury will be, the ones that they say make capital punishment appropriate in this case. Let's take a look at that document. First, they list that the murders of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell were committed for remuneration or financial compensation. The list goes on to say that the murders of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell were especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, manifesting exceptional depravity. And it also says that those murders or the circumstances surrounding their commission that the defendant exhibited utter disregard for human life and finally that that conduct where these killings happened that during the commission or just the murders themselves the way that they were carried out it exhibits a propensity to commit murder which will probably constitute a continuing threat to society so that's what the prosecution is going to be listing in front of this jury as aggravated factors. And we're going to talk about all of those possible factors, starting with the evidence that the murders were committed for financial gain. So let's take a look back at some of that testimony that the state presented in the guilt phase. So this information is derived, again, just solely from the deposits of Social Security into Lori's uh, BBVA account. Uh, as reflected on here, uh, I labeled each account as uh, as to the individual that the money was being deposited from or the benefits from. Uh, and the benefits come from the information from the deceased fathers. We had learned that in the middle of August, I believe it was August 16th, Lori, uh, Tylee's mom, had contacted Social Security and had stopped having the monthly stipends deposited into Ty's account, and she then switched those monies to be deposited in to her own personal account, Lori's personal account from the BBVA, so there were no more funds coming into this account at all. July 11th of 2019, Charles Val was killed in Arizona. Lori applies for benefits in August and starts receiving benefits in September, and this is their first deposit. And as stated earlier, this is uh, not their regular deposit. It's uh, for the back pay when she generated her, her paperwork for to receive the benefits. And then very next box we see on 923, that's our last proof of life for JJ. And then you see the benefits being deposited in uh, they each were receiving uh, $1,951 per month. Is there a total amount of money received after what you believe to be the deaths of Tylee and JJ? Yes, the grand total down the bottom right being the $22,545.05. And in relation to the life insurance policies, were you able to determine the total amount of life insurance on Tammy Daybell? Yes. What was the total amount of coverage? So on the Primerica insurance, it was 300000 And do you recall in relation to LifeMap what the total was? 130000 And when you looked at those policies on the Primerica, was Chad also an insured? He was. What about the LifeMap? Was Chad also an insured? Only Tammy? Only Tammy. Who was Tammy's beneficiary for the life map? Chad Daybell. Who was Tammy's beneficiary for Primerica? Chad Daybell. 
Through the investigation, were you able to determine if that life insurance was ever paid out? Yes. And what did you learn? I learned both of them had been paid out. And who were they paid to? To Chad Daybill. Still with me, Rex Connor, Mike King, and John DeLynn. Thank you all for being here. Mike King, I want to start with you. And I actually want to ask you about one of the aggravators that's not listed in the notice filed by the prosecution, but it is in the statute. They could have listed it if they felt there was evidence of it, that if this murder was committed in perpetration of a ritualized abuse of a child. Tell me if you think this case qualifies for that and why perhaps the state didn't include it in their notice. So, so I think the reason it was left out most likely is that they feel like they have enough with those solid things. I mean, when you start putting the money down and putting who benefits from the death of Tammy, who in the meeting with the kids disappeared or pushed out of the picture. Now, if, if the kids were gone, that would get rid of that money. So it was important that they kept that secret. Then the, those are really solid things that you can take. But the sentencing is such a crucial part because you can also introduce things maybe wouldn't introduce in trial. And you're right on target with that, Julia, because the ritualism in this case really comes into play. This abuse of authority and position, for, for one thing, this idea that, hey, I'm a self-proclaimed prophet and I'm doing what God wants and you'll be in line. Um, you, you've got to, to weigh those kinds of things real heavily. And then the idea of castings and assigning levels of darkness so that you can justify murder. All of those fall within the ritual crime spectrum. And this is the time to bring it out, not in the trial. And I'm really glad. And, and I hope that they, if, if I had any influence with the prosecution, would be now's the time to bring up those and actually a little short list of other things. Well, we usually see a lot more in the penalty phase than we can in the guilt phase. But John, let me ask you, this is listed as a heinous, atrocious, cruel crime. Every murder feels like it's cruel, but it has to raise to a certain level in order to qualify here. Uh, what do you think about this case stands out as particularly heinous, atrocious, and cruel? But also, do you think the fact that Chad Daybell was espousing religious beliefs, if that's going to make it more aggravating to the jury. Yeah, this is so complex because I, I'll be the first to admit as someone raised Mormon, as someone who's spent his life interacting with and dealing with Mormons, that uh, obviously the overwhelming majority of Mormons don't kill their kids um, and, and the beliefs don't necessarily lead to that. So I don't think anybody is claiming that Mormonism leads to murder. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, the the jury is going to feel conflicted. I, I don't even know if we know the religious composition of the jury. At least I don't. Um, but but I think I think it's uncomfortable for all of us to hear, uh, you know, Mormon Church doctrine interwoven with these heinous crimes. Um, and uh, I think most people like to ignore the religious elements of it because uh, this this country stands for religious freedom and the majority of us have some sort of religious beliefs. So I think it's really uncomfortable. I think it's really awkward. And I understand why people wanna downplay or ignore the religious element. Uh, I just think if we do, we do that at our own peril because uh, we, you know, we fail to make the changes that we need to make uh, to prevent this type of thing from happening again. And no doubt the judge in this case thoroughly vetted these jurors when they were coming through the jury selection process to make sure they wouldn't let their religious beliefs impact how they decide in this case. But sometimes it is very hard to avoid. Rex, there's another aggravator that's listed where, and it was in the initial notice of intent to seek the death penalty against Lori and Chad. We know they dropped it against Lori and only are seeking the death penalty against Chad but about them being a continuing threat to society, believing that they have the propensity to do this again. Do you think that that would be possible if, it, if in some way Chad Daybell was able to get out on parole if he gets life in prison? Do you think he's still a threat? Not only possible, but um, very probable. And same with Lori. I, as long as... Both of them are kept away from other members of society by being in jail the rest of their life. 
I think we're safe. But that idea just scared me, whether it was Lori's verdict or with Chad's upcoming verdict. What if they weren't? What if they could get out? That's just horrifying. Who would be safe? If they could do this to the victims to which they did this or to with whom they did this, who would be safe after that? So I hope they both stay in there the rest of their lives. That's what the prosecution is going to be arguing for, not only stay behind bars the rest of their lives, but that they will be subjected to the death penalty. My guests aren't going anywhere because when we're coming back, we're going to switch gears and talk about the other side of this. John Pryor is no doubt going to put up a strong mitigation defense for Chad Daybell. We'll talk about those factors and what they could be in this penalty phase. Chad Daybell was not involved with Charles Vallow. Fact, Chad Daybell is not implicated with Brandon Boudreaux. Fact, Chad Daybell espoused religious beliefs. And if you want to believe the prosecutor, well, maybe Chad Daybell did a South-Southwest search. Where's the agreement? Where is the agreement? It's not there. That was Chad Daybell's defense attorney, John Pryor, during his closing arguments yesterday before this jury rejected that defense theory when they found out today or found today that Chad was involved in the conspiracy and murder, murders rather of J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell. So we're looking now at what kind of mitigating factors might attorney Pryor present on Chad's behalf. In the penalty phase, it's starting tomorrow. This jury is sequestered. They're in a hotel. They're going to go immediately into the penalty phase. Now, the statute doesn't require that the defense has to have a list of what their mitigating factors will be, and there's not really a limit to what they can raise the way it is for the state. It has to be one of the factors that's listed in the statute. Here at Court TV, we put together a list of possible mitigating factors based on what the defense presented during trial at the guilt phase. Some of those possible mitigating circumstances could be that Chad Daybell is a father to five children. He has those family ties. He also has religious beliefs and may have truly held some of those religious beliefs. Also, that he was love struck by Lori, and that Lori Vallow was the mastermind behind all of this that happened. And also, something that's come out a lot during trial is this argument from the defense that Chad was less experienced than Lori, that he was just following her around like a puppy dog. Still with me, Rex Connor, Mike King, and John DeLynn. Weighing in on this, uh, let's talk about these mitigators. Uh, Rex, let me start with you, because he does have family. He has a daughter, he has sons, he has multiple daughters, multiple sons, grandchildren, people who love him. Do you think that that's going to be enough for this jury to say we're going to spare his life because they've heard directly from this family? I don't believe so. I know um, if I were in that position, my family would not be supporting something I did that's completely evil and so heinous that it defies description. I think the jury could see through his family members participation in it so i don't think that will be a factor in fact looking at that list i you know john Pryor's going to give it his best shot as he as he has to date but it's not much to work with for him and mike weigh in on this other idea that lori was the leader that she was the one who was carrying out this plan that she was in charge actually i do want to play if we can what his mother, Sheila, had to say about her son and Lori and the way that they operated. If we have that, can we play that first? And then I do want to get Mike King's reaction on the other side. He's not uh, gregarious. Do you understand what the word gregarious means? Yes. Okay. Yes. He's not a gregarious personality, is he? No. Um, he met Tammy at a relatively young age. Yes. And they got married very young. Yes. Uh, your, your son, Chad, is not necessarily the, a man of the world, right? Not worldly. 
So he had, he didn't have like a lot of experience in dealing with uh, relationships or anything like that, correct? No. In fact, Tammy was really his only ever real serious relationship. Yes. And that's the woman he married. Yes. Now, if we fast forward to Lori Vallow, um, she was a, a different personality, a much more dynamic personality, correct? Yes. They didn't believe it in the guilt phase, Mike. They didn't believe that she was a leader enough to re absolve him of any culpability. But do you think it's compelling in the mitigation portion of this case? Will it move the needle at all or will it just be neutral for this jury? I think if anything, it might even be negative for the defense to try that, Julia. They felt so miserably with it the first time around. I think the jury is tired of hearing Pryor bring up the same thing over and over again. I think they're gonna have to look at some things like, and I love the list that Court TV has come up with, but I'd add to it the possibility of maybe some judicial errors, but that would be corrected after a, a, a death penalty ruling anyway. So that doesn't get me too worried. Or this idea of kind of like social healing and, and restorative justice by saying, hey, let's move on. I think the big push is gonna be exactly what you identified. These kids have already lost their mother. Do you want to? be the group of people that's going to take away their father. Yeah, you mentioned that about um, perhaps what they feel as far as the jury about the death penalty. And John, you mentioned people being uncomfortable with connecting religion to this at all. But do you think their religious beliefs, not about connecting their religious beliefs to Chad and Lori, but their own personal religious conviction, if that could hinder them from choosing death in this case. Even if they reject everything John Pryor says, they can still make a decision as to whether death is appropriate here. Yeah, well, the, the Mormon church historically uh, has actually been supportive of the death penalty. Uh, in fact, Utah for many, many years allowed death by firing squad. It wasn't until relatively recently that they stopped that. Um, Lately, just in the past several years, I think the church has changed its stance from being fully supportive of the death penalty to being neutral um, about the death penalty. I don't think any any average Mormon is going to have any problem with, with the death penalty per se. The only other thing I just want to say about mitigating circumstances, and believe me, I want Chad Daybell behind bars for life. Or, or to experience the death penalty. But there is a very strong case to be made that he was following core Mormon doctrine. In the Book of Mormon, uh, the, the main prophet or character in, in Nephi, he writes in the Book of Mormon, and it came to pass that the Spirit said unto me again, slay him, for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring to forth his righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. So it's there in the fourth chapter of First Nephi, the Book of Mormon, that if the Holy Ghost of the Spirit tells you to kill someone, that you can do it. And Chad can say, the Book of Mormon taught me that. I was operating under the Holy Ghost and I was operating under religious beliefs. And again, it's horrible, it's uncomfortable, but that's right there in the Book of Mormon, you know, in chapter four. And John, a follow-up question thing. is, because you've watched this trial, you've seen how it's unfolded and how John Pryor has presented inside this courtroom. He's really labeled himself as more of an outsider. He said multiple times during this trial that I don't understand or say that I understand what Chad's beliefs are, perhaps even the Mormon faith. Uh, he's gotten a lot of these witnesses to clarify things for him in front of the jury. Do you think that he would go that far as to reading off scriptures and trying to connect that to what Chad Daybell believed? I, I would say it's, it, it would be surprising for me to see that play out inside of a courtroom. Well, Mr. Pryor actually asked me to be an expert witness for him, and I politely declined. That would be a very far... A uh, far off thing to do. I hope he doesn't do that. But uh, my only point is he could do that. He would have scriptural basis for doing that. And my bigger point isn't so much to counsel him. Uh, it's, it's more just to say we need to take deeper looks at what religions teach people and religions need to edit and change 
sometimes scripture, theology, doctrine, and make it really clear to members that some stuff is wrong and should never be believed or followed. Be, or, or we'll have these things keep happening. The Mormon church probably could have prevented this if they had been more clear in their doctrine and theology. And this stuff is gonna keep happening, I think. And that's my biggest worry. That's why I'm on the show. I don't want this stuff to keep happening. It is a big day tomorrow because of what is going to be unfolding. And we appreciate all the analysis for all, from all of our guests, Rex Connor, Mike King, and John DeLynn. That's all the time we have for, for now.